Hey, good day everyone. Thank you for joining me. Michael Didier here. We just last week went through the commandments which Yehovah gave to his called out men. Called out spiritual men. Remember the Gareb came out too, didn't they? They came out with Israel's seed. We saw in the past weeks that Israel's seed were Ezra men, spiritually born men. It was them only who came to the mountain and had Yehovah speak to them. Do you remember the first thing he said? I am Yehovah thy Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other Elohim before my face. Elohim. You know, the temptation is to make them the god Ra or the gods of the Amorites or the gods of the Babylonians. I don't even want to name them. But we don't understand that the Elohim that we're talking about are men. Men. Man, we got to get this. And I'm going to make it very clear for you today that we're talking about having no other Elohim before my face. We're talking about men. Now, we're going to see Israel has Elohim in their cities, within our gates. We have Elohim, the man of Israel, Israel's seed, who has his own land, is the Elohim in his gates. And he appoints other Elohim to work with him. Moses did exactly the same thing. We're going to see it today, and it's going to become much more clear for you. The second commandment, I think we confuse it with the first commandment. The second commandment is you shall not make yourself images. Thyself, thou shalt not make to thyself. Remember, he's always talking to the Israel's seed, each man individually. The ladies aren't there, the gear aren't there, the sons, the daughters. Well, the sons might be there. The daughters aren't there. The male servant and the female servant probably are not there. They're not Israel's seed, but they belong to Israel's seed. You shall, thou shall not make for thyself images, any likeness of anything that is in heaven, on earth, under the water. We have all kinds of images. The third commandment we talked about last week, thou shall not take the name of Jehovah in vain. Not talking about swearing. Well, indirectly, it's talking about swearing because we're taking, we're taking an oath in Yehovah's name. And if we're going to take an oath in Yehovah's name, because what Yehovah says, he does. So we, his son, better do the same. Taking his name in vain is going to get you kicked out of Israel. You don't want to get kicked out of Israel. You've been too worked too hard to get into Israel. Well, we looked at the fourth commandment briefly. It was given to the thou. Who's the thou? We saw it very clearly. The thou is not the son. The thou is not the daughter because it says thou shall do six days. Thou shall labor and do thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yehovah. Thy Elohim, in it thou shalt do no work, thou nor thy son, it's not the son, thy daughter, it's not the daughter, thy male servant, thy female servant, thy ox, or the stranger who is within thy gates, it's not any one of them. So we eliminated all but the woman, thy and thy woman. Well, by the 10th commandment, we eliminated her as well. So we found that the only one it can be is the Ezra men. And the Ezra men are what 
is poorly, poorly translated by practically every translator out there as the children of Israel. Some go for the men of Israel, but they're both not specific enough. We talked about murder. Remember, thou shalt not murder. It doesn't say thou shalt not kill. Many times he tells us to kill somebody, shakat someone. Or the word that they used seemed was, uh, here it is, harag, harag. It's the same word that he used when he was talking to Pharaoh. So, if you, so I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will harag, kill your son, your firstborn. And he did. He killed every one of the men in Egypt before we left. Why? Because they didn't let us go. They kept coming on us again, trying to get us to return. What Jehovah says, Jehovah does. He left Pharaoh alive. He was the only one left alive. Why? Because I think he wanted Pharaoh to know what I say, I do. Wow. It's quite amazing to see some of these things. Well, the last thing we talked about, as far as the Ten Commandments are concerned, was thou shall not covet. What did it say? You shall not covet thy neighbor's house thy neighbor's woman, his male servant, his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey. But now listen to what it says, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. The house, the woman, the male servant, the female servant, the ox, the donkey, or anything that is thy neighbor's are all possessions. Oh, you know what? We make such a terrible foundation for ourselves when we have in our minds that men and women are treated the same by Yehovah. It's a deadly mistake, costly mistake, perhaps even an eternal mistake. We're going to see today that Yahovah treats women differently than he does men. Let's watch for that as we go through these things. The last thing that we talked about last week was this. Verse 23. He said, you shall not make anything to me to be with me. Elohim of gold. Elohim of silver, you shall not make for yourselves. Oh my goodness, he said this. Well, we remember he's talking to uh, Moses right now. This is the third time that Moses has gone up the mountain. No, the fourth time that he's gone up the mountain. He's still there. We. Israel's seed are down below right now with Aaron. Don't ask me why Aaron went, why Aaron remained and Joshua went. He clearly said in the end of 19 that Aaron was supposed to go up with him the next time. He didn't. Joshua went up with him. Aaron stayed behind. And Aaron is going to be making a golden calf. Oh my goodness, what in the world is going on? So he says, thou shalt not make this. But look at the very next work. An altar of earth, you, this is the first time he's saying you, y'all shall make for me and shall slaughter on it your ola and your shalomim, your sheep and your oxen. But look at what he says, and I want to read it on the right-hand side here, because I think this is very interesting. I'm going to read it again. An altar of earth thou. Oh, I take it back. That is individual. 
That's supposed to be an in yellow. An altar of earth, that's second person, singular, masculine. An altar of earth, thou shall make to me. This is all the same people that he's talking to when he was talking about the Ten Commandments. Thou shall not murder. Thou shall keep the Sabbath. Thou shall honor thy mother, thy father. Thou shall have no other Elohim before my face. Look what he says. An altar of earth thou shall make to me. And thou shalt slaughter on it thy Olah and thy Shalomim, thy flocks and thy cattle. But now look into what he says. In all the places my name shall be remembered, I will come to thee and bless thee. Do you remember when Abraham made altars? Do you remember when Isaac made altars and Jacob made altars? Memorable places. And Jehovah came to them and blessed them. Remember when Jacob made his altar, he had just been robbed by Esau's son Eliphaz. Ten men came with him. He was only like 12 years old. Robbing his uncle. Left him his staff. That was it. He had all kinds of provisions going north to Haran to take a bride. Maybe two. Didn't plan on two. But he was discouraged after he was robbed and heading home. And he made an altar to Yehovah. And Yehovah came to him and blessed him and said, I will multiply you. I will bless you. I will give you riches and honor. Male and female servants, sons and daughters. You got one daughter. An altar of earth thou shalt make to me. Well, I talked about that last week. Let's continue this week. We're going to do chapter 21. This is it right here. Now these are the judgments which you shall set before them. You, this is thou. So he's talking to who? He's talking to Moses, singular, which thou shall set before them. You know what? It's really important that we understand thou the, thy, and thine, as opposed to you and your, and ye. These are really, really important. You can see it when you go to the King James. Now these are the judgments which thou shall set before them. He's talking to Moses, a singular man, set before them. But listen what he says. If thou by a Hebrew servant. He's talking again to each man individually. Masculine, singular. Second person. Very important that we understand this. Who is he talking to when he gives his commandments? He's not talking to the ladies. He's talking to Israel's seed. See, this gives us the whole incentive that we need to become Israel's seed. When we see this is who Yahweh is talking to, I'm talking to men, not their women. Let's go back. I like the New King James. I wish the New King James did have the these and the thous. But too many people think that's not important. I think it's so very, very, very important. He goes on. If you buy a Hebrew servant, a Hebrew servant. This is a man who is called out. A Hebrew. He shall serve six years. And in the seventh, the seventh year, he shall go out free and pay nothing. Well, later on, we're going to see that we not only send him out free and pay nothing, but we're also going to provide him, provision him for a new start. Wow, pretty amazing. Of course, you know, you get a Hebrew servant working for you. There's a man that is a diligent servant. 
a faithful servant, a servant we can trust in to work hard and to work well for us. A good man. Servant, a bed. You know what? You're not going to see this word a bed, meaning a woman, anywhere. So whenever we see this word a bed, we know we're talking about a male servant always. Verse three. If he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in, look at the word here, you guys. It says married. The word is, comes in with a Baal woman. Here it is, Baal. Baal. Isha. A Baal woman. If he comes in with a Baal woman, he shall go. Then his woman, if he comes in Baal married, then his Isha shall go out with him. His Isha. Here's the Ish right here. Whoops. Here's one. This is Ish right here. Here you can see it here. Aleph Shin He. Or Aleph Shin, they use a Tav here, but it's He. They just put the Tav because they're going to put the Vav after it for his Isha. It's a conjugation. We got to learn the conjugations. Verse 4, if his master has given him a woman, so during these six years that he's going to be working for him, his master's going to give him a woman. Oh, my goodness. How does that fit in today's understandings? The master is going to give him a woman. Does the woman have any say in the matter? You know, if he's a kind master, maybe he's already seen an attraction to this man, perhaps. But maybe he just simply wants to multiply his stock of male and female servants. He's going to give him a woman. It says a wife. It's not a wife, it's a woman. It says, give him a woman. Here, this is it right here. If his master, his Adonai, this is what it says, here's Adonai, from here to here, whoops, from here, oh boy, that's really hard. There's Adonai, the Vav says his, if his Adonai has given him a woman, Isha, and she has borne him sons, not children, sons is what the word is here, gets translated as children, or daughters, the woman, and her children shall be her masters. Hear that? The master gave this Hebrew servant a woman. He begat sons and daughters. But the woman and the children belong to the master. Children, here's the word they use for children, yelled, yelled. It's uh, actually her yelladim is what it's, what it's saying there. And her yelladim shall be her masters, her adans. And he shall go out by himself. Oh, he's taken a woman, begat sons and daughters, and now he's going to leave by himself. Wow. But look what it says. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, you know what? He loves his master. my woman and my children. It actually says, my son. 
I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. The judges, look at what the word is here for judges. What he's saying, I am Yahovah, thy Elohim, lawmaker and judge. Thou shall have no other Elohim existing before my face. Here it says, then he shall, then his master shall bring him to the judges. The judges is the very same word, the Elohim. Remember, we're talking about the Elohim on the mountain. This is the Elohim in the qualitative sense. No, quantitative sense. The plural sense. Not the exalted qualitative sense that we think of when we talk about the Elohim of all creation. He's talking about the gods. The Elohim of the city. You see, we've got to understand what an Elohim is. Lawmakers and judges. Then the master shall bring him to the Elohim. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Did you hear that? His master's going to put his ear to the doorpost, put an awl through his ear as a sign that this man is now his permanent servant. His wife, his sons were already the master's permanent servant. But now this man is going to be his permanent servant. What does that mean? It means all the servant seed, his sons and his sons will serve the master and his sons forever. So if I'm the master and this man has sworn allegiance to me to become my servant forever, his seed, the sons that he birthed and his daughters for that matter, are going to be already my servants forever and the servants of my sons forever. Do you hear something going on here? This man goes free, his woman stays because she was given to him by the master. But now we're going to talk about a female servant, a daughter of a Hebrew man. Look what it says, verse seven. And if a man sells his daughter to be a female slave, female slave. Let's look at the word that is there. I'm guessing it's an ama, an ama, to be an ama. There it is right there, ama. Female servants, they make it slave. All right, it can be slave, I guess. Let's talk about servants. You know what? The words we use stir things in us. And perhaps they use slaves because they want to be so egregious that we won't do those things. But we're going to do those things. In the last days, Yehovah is going to raise up the contrite man, the man who has a humble heart. And he's going to make those who ruled over us become our servants. And our Amma, perhaps, as well, because we've got women leading us, women judges, women politicians. My people are destroyed. Women and infants rule over them. This is where we're at right now. Because we have been disobedient. Let's go back. If a man sells his daughter to be a female servant, an ama, listen to what it says, 
she shall not go out as the male servants do, as the Aved, Avedim do. Plural of Aved. She will not go out. She's going to stay. She's there permanently. Difference between a man and a woman? We've got to understand this. It's part of the foundation for getting a deeper and fuller understanding of what Yahweh's word actually says. It says if she does not please her master, her job is to please her master. then he shall let her be redeemed. Hear that? He shall let her be redeemed. Redeemed. How do you redeem somebody? Remember, you redeem property. When we talk about Ruth and Naomi and the redemption process that was going, he was redeeming the land. He was redeeming the land for the ladies. It had been sold. He's buying it back. So that now they can go, they can go dwell in it. But as a kindred redeemer, it's going to be his land. He's simply providing a place for the ladies in his house. He's going to take one of them as his bride. It's about redeeming property, not people. She is property. Oh, I know, I know, I know. It sounds so weird to say that. We are, we are so entrenched in our understandings that to talk about a woman as property, we can't handle it. Well, you know what? We got to renew our minds. We got to learn to handle it. We got to learn to understand our place in this world and our created purpose before Yehovah. Let me read the verse again because I still haven't got through the end of it. If she does not please her master, her Adon, who has betrothed her to himself, look at that, she got betrothed to her master. Did she have a choice in the matter? then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people. To no cray um is the word that they're using here. Here's the word no cray. No cray. No cray um. To no cray um. Can't sell her to foreign people. She's a Hebrew servant. We don't let our daughters go to foreign people. We got to keep her in the society. Since he has dealt deceitfully with her. How has he dealt deceitfully with her? How did he deal deceitfully with this woman? Taking her to be his wife. She wasn't pleasing to him. How is that being deceitful? I don't know. How come she can't just go back to the servant quarters? Why does she have to be redeemed? He shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her. All questions in my mind that I don't have any answers for. There's lots of questions that I have. Someday, maybe Yahovah is going to give us the insight that we need. It may be a lifelong process, an eternal process to learn the ways of Yahovah fully. But you know what? Those of us who are in this, in this and have learned the ways of Yahovah are put in a position to teach others the same things. Yeah, we're still learning. It says when Yahovah brings back Zion, remember Zion as his people, his called out man, the holy city, Yerushalayim. All people. He says his watchmen shall see eye to eye. Is he going to download us with the information that we need? We'll know exactly why he's dealt deceitfully with her. Or maybe that's a poor translation. I didn't look at that carefully. 
Could be. Could be it's a, a poor translation. Nine. And if he has betrothed her to his son, he shall deal with her according to the customs of daughters. What are the customs of daughters? Couldn't find them. More questions. I hate that. Father, I want to know more. What are the customs of daughters? What are the daughter's customs? It's really what it's saying, the daughter's customs. If he takes another woman, if he takes another, talking about a woman, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. Food, clothing, and marital rights. This is if he takes another woman, not the first woman, another woman. He shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. How many women can a man have anyway? How many wives can a man have? Well, let's think about it. Jacob had four. Abraham had two at one time. Sagar, Hagar, and Sarai, Sarah. David had 12. Benjamin had two. What was it? Simeon had two. One of them was his sister, Diana, and her servant, her maidservant, her Shema. No, her, what's maidservant? Shifka. Shifka. Good job, Carissa. And her Shifka. Multiple women in a man's life. Look what it says about in the last days. This is Isaiah 4.1 on the right here. And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own food, wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. What is their reproach? I think these are women who do not have a man in their life and they realize that they have no relationship with Yehovah without a man in their life. Woman doesn't go into the temple. Woman doesn't come into covenant with Yehovah Passover. Men do. So much more for us to see. Noah and his woman, what was his woman's name? Naamah, I think. Naamah, she didn't come through the flood based on her righteousness. It was because Noah walked with Elohim. This is what we're going to see in the last days. This is why women are coming to the Ezra men in these last days. Food, clothing, and marital rights conjugal visits. And if he does not do these three for her, then she shall go out free without paying money. This is for the second woman, not the first woman. She shall go out free without paying money. Each one of these things, when I have a blue here, or purplish blue, is a new thought. So I'm kind of marking these as new thoughts. Here's a new thought. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. Who's he talking to? Israel's seed. But remember, One law shall be for the native born and for the gare who dwells with you. One law. But it applies differently to the gare than it does to the Ezra. Don't think that it applies the same to both men. You'd be wrong. We're going to see that today. They're both one law. 
but they apply differently. Remember, the gear literally should not be a gear for more than or for for more than a year, because when Passover comes, he's got the duty to become an Ezra man. Wow, that'll blow your mind. He who strikes a man, a man, a man, a man, it's a niche. How come it doesn't say woman or a person? So he dies, shall surely be put to death. Oh, Father, inquiring minds want to know. Here, this is moot, moot. Strikes a man so that he dies, dies, death, moot, moot. Same word, so that he dies, he shall be put to death. Both verbs. However, oh, here, let me read this too. He who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. We're going to get to that in two more verses. Four more verses. He who kidnaps a man, an ish, an ish again, and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. Why does Father choose these words, ish? Like I say, inquiring minds want to know. However, if he did not lie in wait, remember, it's the Rashak, the murderer. Thou shall not Rashak, is the commandment. Thou shall not murder. However, if he did not lie in wait, it wasn't a Rishak, but Elohim delivered him into his hands. Isn't that interesting? Yahovah delivered him into his hands. Not the man's hand, not Yahweh's hands, the man's hands. Then I will appoint for him, for you, a place, probably. Here, let's go. We got it. Let's check it. It's got to be for thee, because we're talking about a singular man, aren't we? Then I will appoint for thee, there it is, I will appoint thee a place where, whither he shall flee. I will appoint a place. He did. He appointed six places for us to flee to. I really want you to see these places and see how Yehovah has them planned for us. Let's go to... I'm going to open this map. Uh, I'll open the main map. And I'm going to have to give it another period. All right. Here we are. He's got several places. Let's look at the stuff on the east side first. This is Golan, Ramath Gilead, and Bezer. There they are right there. These are Places of refuge. You hit, killed somebody by accident. You ran into him with your car and you killed a man. You had a hammer. The head got away from you. Nagged the guy in the head and killed him. It was an accident. Oh no. You go to the city of refuge before his brother, his near of kin, the avenger of blood, comes and shakats you. Or maybe, what was the word, harag? You. Kills you. Might be shakat. Kills you. Golan, Ramath Gilead, Bezer. Let's find him. Not hard. Golan. Ramath Gilead. Right here. And Bezer is right here. Spread out, north, south, and kind of center. You won't find them on there, baby. I tried to find them. The other ones on the west side are, are Kadesh, Shechem, 
and Hebron. Those are the cities of refuge. Those are the Levitical cities. Kadesh, Shechem, Hebron. Let's go to the map. Here's Kadesh. It's the highest one. Right here. Kadesh. Shechem is always at the, at the mouth of this river. Uh, right here. You can find Shechem. Here it is. And then Hebron is the city that Abraham made his home for so long down here, Hebron. Again, north, south, one way north, one way south, and one centralized location. I wonder if there's times where someone did something on the west side and the kindred redeemer thought, ah, he's going for there. I'm going to head him off at the pass. And he decided to go to the west side instead of the east side. City, city of refuge. If the Avenger of Blood is going to say, ah, I bet he's going for Bezer. He's right here. What if he says, I'm not going to go to Bezer. I'm going to go to Shechem. Goes in a different direction to keep himself safe and to get to a city of refuge safely. Got to be smart. Okay, let's continue. Well, we talk, we're going to talk about cities of refuge when we get to uh, Numbers 35. We'll talk about the cities of refuge at length. But if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor, he's a Rishak, to kill him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. Not going to put up with it. Even when he gets to the, to the city of refuge, when the judge is there, the Elohim who are there, here's the story. They may decide, no, this man did this with premeditation. He's a Rishak. They'll kill him there. Take him from my altar. What does it mean, take him from my altar? You shall take him from my altar that he may die. Separation from Yahovah is death. Eternal. Eternal death. We don't want to be separated from Yehovah's altar. He's our Elohim. Don't get separated. Don't be a Rashak. Thou shall not Rashak. 15. And he who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Don't strike your mother or father. Here, we've had other places where it's said that. For everyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. There's cursing your mother or father. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. Deuteronomy says, Curse is the one who treats his father or his mother with contempt. And all the people shall say, Amen. <laughs> Whoever curses his father and his mother, his lamp will be put out in deep darkness. There is a generation that curses its father, and it does not bless its mother. That's Proverbs. Lots of good wisdom. Another thought. If men, 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 this is enoshim, plural, ish, contend with each other. And one strikes the other with a stone or with his fists. And he does not die, but is confined to his bed. If he rises again and walks about the city with his staff, then he, has then he who struck him shall be acquitted. He shall only pay for the loss of his time and shall provide for him to be thoroughly healed. That is equity. That is justice. Unfortunately, in this world we live in today, there is no equity. There is no justice. Inequity is what we end up with. New thought, 2120. Look what it says. We're talking about property this time. 
male and female servants. Treated the same, they're property. But we even saw that even the female servant is treated differently than the Hebrew servants. If a man beats his male or female servant with a rod, oh, domestic violence. If a man beats his male or female servant with a rod, so that he dies under his hand. I'm just thinking back to the 1800s, the 1700s, the 1600s. We had a much better understanding of the role of men and women in those days. And if a man beats his male or female servant with a rod, so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Punished, not killed. Punished. Notwithstanding, if he remains alive a day or two, this is the male or female servants, if they remain alive a day or two, he shall not be punished. Why? For they are his property. Oh my goodness. So much to learn. Female servant, that's the Amma. Male servant, that's the Aved. I don't know why I have Amma twice. I guess I have his female servant, his Amma, is what the other one says. I guess I should, if we're going to do it twice, we should at least say it correctly. His Amma. How does that fit with this? Surely for your lifeblood, remember we're talking about talking to Noah, Yahweh's people, and his sons at this point, Genesis 9. Surely for your lifeblood, I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast, I will require it. And from the hand of the man, Ha Adam, and from the man of and from the hand of Ha Adam. From the hand of every man's brother, this is Isha's brother, I will require the life of the man. The man, the man, the man. Whoever sheds the man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of Elohim, he made the man. But a servant is fit, apparently, into a different role. He's not treated the same as a free man. The man of Elohim, the Ezra or the Ger. But what about a woman? You shall not covet your woman's house, your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's woman, nor his male servant, his female servant. It's all about men coveting another man's property when we're talking about that. So how does that fit back to this? It's a male or female servant. Is it possible that in respect to a beating, in respect to a death or an injury, that male and female slaves are not looked upon as male or female, but more as property? That's what it looks like to me. It says he is his property. That's what it says. If men knew thought, if men fight and hurt a pregnant woman, so we're talking about a pregnant woman, fight and hurt a pregnant woman, here it is. Harah, pregnant woman with child, it says. It's a pregnant woman. But now look what it says. This is so interesting. If men fight, this is Enoshim. If Enoshim fights and hurt a pregnant woman so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm come, no harm follows, he shall surely be punished according, accordingly as the woman's Baal imposes. Did you hear that? 
the child of the Baal is armed. The woman's master, surely be, he shall surely be punished accordingly as the woman's master imposes on him. And he shall pay as the judges determine. Well, we just were talking about it being the master's decision. Which is it? Let's look at it again. Uh, New King James, where are you there? Here it is. Accordingly, as the woman's Baal imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. So it looks to me like he's the one man, the, the Baal is going to say something, and then the judge is going to say whether or not that's fair or not. Is that what it looks like to you? How come it's the man that does it? How come it's the woman's Baal who's going to make the decision about, the, about what's to be imposed on this man? Because it's his son, his child. Let's continue. Same thought, different verse. But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life. Eye for eye. Child is born damaged. Sounds like these guys are going to be damaged. Tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. You know what? This may be, we're talking about what? We're talking about two men fighting. If harm follows, maybe it has nothing to do with the woman at this point. He gouges out somebody's eye, he's going to get his eye gouged out. He breaks the guy's arm, he's going to get his arm broken. That's equity. That's justice in the land. Hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. But now, look at this. Again, we're talking about a man with his male or female servants. If a man strikes the eye of his male or female servant and destroys it, he shall let him go, oh, he, the, the man shall let him go free for the sake of his or her eye. Gonna be set free for an eye. And look at this, also for a tooth. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant. Our master's violent? What's going on here? I guess Yahovah has to deal with masters. Remember, we're talking about a rod, beats him with a rod so that he dies. Do masters have to be that mean? If a man strikes the eye of his male or female servant and destroys it, he shall let him go for the sake of his eye. And knocks out the tooth of his male or servant, male or female servant, he shall let him go for the sake of the tooth. Interesting. 28, new thought. Changing gears. If an ox scores a man or a woman to death, Here's an ox going a man or a woman. Now, isn't this interesting? How come he talks about a man or a woman? He can do it, but he didn't do it up here, did he? He says, he who kidnaps a man, strikes a man so that he dies, he shall surely be put to death. Here we're talking about a man or a woman. What verse was I on here? Yeah, here it is. If an ox scores a man or a woman. What do we have here? Man, ish, woman, isha, to death. If an ox scores a man or a woman to death, then the ox shall surely be stoned and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. 
the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. If your property does damage to somebody else's property, there's a potential for your liability in the matter. Look what it says. But if the ox tended to thrust with its horns in times past, and it has been made known to the owner, who's the owner? It's the Ezra man. They're the ones that own the property. Oh my goodness. There's training that has to go on with our property. We're going to see it. We have to train our servants. We have to train our animals or destroy our animals. But if the ox tended to thrust with his horn in time past and has been made known to the owner, and he has kept it, he has not kept it confined, so that it has killed a man or a woman. The ox shall be stoned, and the owner shall be put to death. Hear that? Because you had an ox. How about a dog? How about where are some of these really mean breeds? Well, I guess any breed can be mean. But say you had a dog tended to bite, and you didn't protect him, now he's killed somebody. How's that different from an ox? I don't think it would be. And its owner shall be put to death. Hear that? But look at this. He can buy himself away. If there is imposed upon him a sum of money, a sum of money. He can buy himself off. Doesn't have to die if he's rich. If there is imposed on him a sum of money, then he shall pay to redeem his life. He's going to redeem his life. Whatever is imposed on him, whatever is imposed, he shall pay to redeem his hive, whatever is imposed upon him. Oh, how interesting. Verse 31. Whether he has gored a son or gored a daughter, according to the judgment, it shall be done to him. According to the judgment. It looks like it's going to go into the hands of the, I forget the word for the judge. We'll call him the Elohim for right now. If the ox gored a male or female servant, look at, they're good. this is a man or a woman, now we're talking about a son or a daughter. Now we're talking about a female servant or a male servant. Look at the different judgments that are related to whether it was a man or a woman. These are free men, free women, not male, female servants, not sons, daughters. Got to get the right picture in our mind. If the ox scores a male or female servant, he shall give to his, their master, he, the man who owns the ox, shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver. You killed my servant. He was worth 30 shekels of silver. And the ox shall be stoned. That's it. Torah treats men, women, sons, daughters, male servants, female servants, and gear differently. We've got to understand who everybody is and how Torah relates to them. This is why we need judges. This is why we need the Elohim of the city. And if a man opens a pit, new thought. And if a man opens a pit, let me do this. And if a man opens a pit, or if a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls into it, if a man digs a pit, 
do you have to dig the pit? How about if your servant digs a pit? If the servant digs a pit, did you dig the pit? Yeah, you did. He's your servant. If a man opens a pit, yeah, opens a pit, didn't even dig it, opens it, had somebody to do it for him. Or if a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls into it. But I have here. If a man opens a pit, a man, an ish. Or if a man, ish, opens a pit. Important words, we got to get these things. The owner of the pit shall make it good. Hear that? He's the man. The owner of the pit shall make it good. He shall give money to their he shall give money to their owner, but the dead animal shall be his. New thoughts. If one's ox hurts another, so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the money from it. And the dead ox they shall also divide. Divide. This is if my ox hurts your ox, my cow hurts your cow, my bull hurts your cow. Same thing. Or if it was known that the ox tended to thrust in time past, it's going to be treated differently. Look at this. And its owner has not kept it confined. He shall surely pay ox for ox. You killed my ox. You gotta buy me a new ox, and the dead animal shall be his own. You know, I guess the butcher an, an ox. Didn't really plan on butchering an ox this month, but I guess I'm going to, because I gotta buy an ox for this man that my ox killed. Justice, equity. This is what he wanted. We wanna live in a land that has righteous judgments. Look what it says. I think it's Deuteronomy 4. I just want to go there for a second. I like this portion of Scripture. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments. This is what we're talking about today. We're talking about judgments and statutes. Just as Yahovah, my Elohim, commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom. He's talking to Israel's seed and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation, Israel, Yehovah's Ezra men, is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has Elohim so near to it as Yehovah our Elohim is to us? For whatever reason, we call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you today? Isn't that beautiful? These are the statutes and the righteous judgments that Yehovah is giving for his people. Oh, I want to live in a land like this. Oh, Father, please bring me to my land. Let's continue. If a man steals an ox or a sheep, an ox or a sheep, when we see sheep, I want you to understand that we're talking about sheep and goat. We're talking about flocks. In this particular word, we're talking about say, say, sa. Say, but look, it's it's all about here. I, maybe you can't see it here. Let me just move this down here so you can see it. Look, a member of a flock that is a sheep or a goat. This is what we're talking about, sheep and goats. So when we talk about sheep, we have to understand we're talking about goats too. So let's just develop our understanding so that we can see things that aren't always there because the translators aren't as careful as they should be. Slaughters. If a, if a man, this is, what is the man? Man. If the man, ish. If a man steals an ox 
or a sheep or a goat and slaughters it or sells it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep or goat for the sheep or goat. It's irreplaceable. He, he sold it. He burned it. He ate it. Slaughtered it. It's shakak. Shakak. Oh, zabak. Zab. Zabak? What word do they have there? That's the wrong word. Isn't that interesting? I don't know why I didn't catch that. Let's find out what the word actually is. Tabak. Tabak. Oh, I guess it's right. Yeah, that's not a, uh, that's not a uh, shin, that's a, uh, I don't even know what that is. What is that? No, it's not a tav. This one right here, this this one right here? No, it's not a tav. This is a tav here. No, that's, that's a hat. Uh, yeah. I forget what that one is. Zabak, Zabak. All right, well, learn something new and show my ignorance uh, on one of these letters. Uh, here's what you do. When you find it, you just gotta learn it. You know what? If you don't take the time to learn it, you just never will learn it. Tet is, is the word she says. Where's the tet? It's next to it. There it is, tet. Hats. Yeah, that's the hats. The, the tats. All right, well, relearn something that we should already know. You know, it's a constant, constant battle to get it right. I want to get it right. I hope if you learn anything about me, You'll know that when I don't understand something, I want to look it up. I want to learn it because it's the teachable moment. It's the time where I'm interested in it and it's going to solidify itself in my mind better if I take care of it at the time. You got to take the time to do it. It's a discipline that we have to build into our life. And it's all about learning Yehovah's ways. It's a joy. Yeah, it's work, but it's a joy. Let's continue. I don't claim to know it all. All right. If the thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. Huh. If the thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, breaking into your house? I always thought this was dark. Look what it says. If the thief, here, let's, you know, I guess I don't have anything on there. If the thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, there should be no guilt of bloodshed. But, if the sun has risen on him, there shall be guilt for his bloodshed. That's where I got the idea that it's dark in verse 2. Because of verse 3, if the sun has risen on him, then there shall be guilt for his bloodshed. He shall make full restitution. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. So, you know what? This is a case where the pronouns are confusing. If the thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, he, the thief, is struck so that he dies. Okay, that's, that's who he is. There shall be no guilt for his bloodshed, the thief's bloodshed. But now look what it says in this verse. If the sun has risen on him, the thief, I assume, there shall be guilt for his bloodshed. There shall be guilt for his bloodshed. Is that all they're gonna say about that? Because then they continue, he, who's he? 
sh should make full restitution. He? Is this he the thief? Or he that struck the, struck the thief? They put a semicolon after it and then says, if he has nothing, I guess again, this is the thief, then he shall be sold for his theft. Okay, his theft has to be the thief that he's being sold, right? So he has nothing to, to restore the theft from. Remember, they're found in his hand. He shall pay four, four for, the, for an ox, or five for an ox, four for a sheep, four for a flock. Sheep or goat, I say. If the thief, if the theft is certainly found alive in his hand, remember that was if he kills it or sells it, he's got to replace it four for five. Whether it is an ox or a donkey or a sheep, again, we're looking at sheep and goat, flock, remember, say, he shall restore double. So I found my goat in your hand, you got to give me two goats. How about if you found my dog in your hand? Does he have to give you two dogs? What if you don't want two dogs? <laughs> that was from that was from Raya. I love you, baby, and I love our doggies. He should make full restitution. If he has nothing, then he shall then he shall be sold for his theft. This is how a man gets put into slavery. Would this be a Hebrew the Hebrew slave, a Hebrew servant? Is this same man going to be released at the end of six years? Probably not, unless he's paid back in full what he owed, huh? Or maybe he's just going to be in in bondage in, what do they just call that? Uh, he shall make full as if he has nothing. He shall be sold for his death. Sold for his death. Does that mean he buys himself out? No. He may, he may be a permanent, permanent servant after that. Again, we don't know. Okay, when Yahweh brings back Zion, his watchmen will all see eye to eye. We gotta wait. We see in part, but we just don't have full understanding at this point. He shall be sold for his theft. Here's a, a couple other verses that uh, put this down, which I thought was kind of interesting. Unless it happens after sunrise, this is a uh, uh, CJV, CJB, uh, Contemporary Jewish Bible. Unless it happens after sunrise, in which case it is, in which case it is a, it is murder. A thief must make restitution. So if he has nothing, he himself will be sold to make good for the loss of his theft. Hmm. Here's uh, good news. Uh, God's way. Uh, that's not a, really a translation. That's a uh, paraphrase. I'm not going to use that. Here's uh, New American Standard 77. But if the sun has risen on him, there will be blood guiltiness on his account. He shall surely make restitution. If, his, if he owns nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. I'm just trying to figure out again who is the, who is the blood shed on? Blood guiltiness. We killed a guy breaking into our house in the daytime. Is the blood guiltiness on us? It sounds like it might be. Or maybe they're not talking about killing him. Maybe they're simply talking about the break-in. No, nah, then there's no blood guiltiness. Inquiring minds want to know. So it comes down to new thought. If a man, here it is, if man causes a field or vineyard to be grazed, okay, let's say it's my servant that opened a gate, didn't close the gate, and now the field has been grazed by, by my animals on my neighbor's property. If a man causes a field or vineyard to be grazed and lets loose his animals and it feeds in another man's field, if he shall make restitution from the best of his field and from the best of his vineyard. 
equity. If fire breaks out and catches in thorns, so that stacked grain, standing grain, or the, or the field is consumed, he who kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. Okay, is it, on, is it incumbent on my servant who I told to start the fire? Or maybe I didn't tell him to start the fire, but he's still my servant. The buck stops with me. We've got to train our servants to be careful with gates, to be careful with animals that tend to thrust, to be careful with fire. Maybe that's the reason you'd, you'd be a slave, a servant. You've told him before he didn't get it. Now we have to make it so he gets it. Because the buck stops with us. Could that be? If man delivers to his neighbor money or articles to keep, and it is stolen out of the man's house, if the thief is found, he shall pay double. But if the thief is not found, then the master of the house shall be brought to the Elohim, the judges. It's the Elohim. Look at that. The Elohim. He shall be brought to the judges to see whether he has put his hand into his neighbor's goods. You know what it says to me? It says to me it's not a good idea to take your neighbor's money or articles to keep. To keep them for him. Because there is a responsibility on it. If something happens to it, look what's happening here. To see whether he has put his hand in his neighbor's goods. For any kind of trespass, whether it concerns an ox, a donkey, a sheep, a lamb, or a sheep, I'm sorry, a goat or a sheep, or clothing in this case, or any kind of lost thing which another claims to be his. The cause of both parties shall come before the judges. The Elohim. Thou shall have no other Elohim before my face. Are you starting to understand how important it is that we don't have other Elohim before us? You know, next week, we're not going to get to it this week. I, silly me, I thought maybe we would get to chapter 23 this week and finish it. But the end of chapter 23 is talking about the covenants that we make with the Elohim of the land. I want you to see that next week. The cause of both parties shall come before the judges, the Elohim, and whoever the Elohim, and whomever the Elohim condemn shall pay double to his neighbor. Pay double to his neighbor. No, that's my paint sprayer. No, that's my paint sprayer. Now it's going to go to the judge. Looks to me like you're going to get two paint sprayers if it truly was yours. And you're going to pay another paint sprayer if it wasn't. Equity. What great nation is this that has such judgments and such statutes that are found in them? Beautiful. If a man delivers to his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or any animal to keep, and it dies, is hurt, or driven away. Dies, hurt, or driven away. No one seeing it. Then an oath of Yahovah shall be between both. Hear that? An oath of Yahovah. Thou shall not take the name of Yehovah, thy Elohim, in vain. For Yehovah will not hold him harmless who takes his name in vain. Then the oath of Yehovah shall be between them both. In the name of Yehovah, I did not do anything to it. 
It was not I that caused it to die. It was not I who caused it to be hurt. It was not I who drove it away. That he did not put his hands in his neighbor's good, goods. And the neighbor shall accept that, and he shall not make it good. But if, in fact, it is stolen from him, stolen from him, who's him? The man, deliver, if a man delivers to his neighbor a donkey, okay, the him is the neighbor. If, in fact, it was stolen from him, he shall make restitution to the owner for it. This is why I say, why would we want to take the responsibility for the property of our neighbors? It brings liability on us. Now, in most cases, that's not going to be a problem. But... In some cases, it apparently is a problem. If it dies, if it's hurt, driven away, if it's stolen, if it is torn in pieces by a beast. My dog came and grabbed it. I was watching his chicken, and my dog grabbed it, killed it. He shall bring it as evidence. And he shall not he shall not make and he shall not make good what was torn. Oh I guess by a beast. If it's your dog, I would think you're gonna you know, have to take care of it. But by a beast, if it is if it's torn in pieces. Maybe we don't know who did it. He shall bring it as evidence. It's still here, I still have it. <laughs> Could that be what's going on? Yeah, I still have it. It's a little bit of a mess right now, but I still have it. And he shall not make good what was torn. New thought. Again, a man. And if a man borrows anything from his neighbor, and it becomes injured or dies, the owner of it, not being with it, he shall surely make it good. He is the man who's going to make the loss of the property good. He was borrowing his chainsaw. He was borrowing his ox. He was borrowing his... What else kind of animal would you borrow? Probably ox would be the biggest thing that you would want to borrow, I suppose. I need to, need to till my field. But it died while I had it. And you weren't with me. But now, look at if it's different if the owner is with him. This says the owner is of it is, is not with it. It says, if the owner was with it, he shall not make it good. It if it was hired, it came for its hire. The risk came for its hire. I used I I, I rented your ox. I rented your chainsaw. You were with me when I did it. It says, came with a tire. Another change of gears. Talking about a man taking a virgin. Oh, this is interesting. If a man entices a virgin. A man. What are we talking about? A man. Let's find out. doesn't say it. If Anish entices a virgin who is not betrothed, she's not engaged, she's still in her father's house. If a man entices a virgin who is not betrothed, enticed her, hey baby, let's go to the woods. She is apparently consenting. He shall surely pay the bride price for her to be his woman. Well, that would stop a lot of, of uh, fornication going on in the land. Fornication, you know, that's not a biblical word. He's enticing a virgin. After she's not a virgin anymore, then he's not enticing the virgin anymore, is he? Now he's enticing the woman who's playing the harlot in her father's house. She's going to be killed also. 
Hmm, so much to learn. So many things that we do and so many things that are promoted in this world. You know, the family channel is teaching 12 year olds how to have sex. Encouraging it, it seems like. You watch so many of these family channel kid programs, teenager programs, they're all getting sexually promiscuous. If a man entices a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall surely pay the bride price for her to be his woman. I had to ask myself, what's the bride price? Turns out it's 50 shekels of silver. How interesting. Look what it says here. This is not about her being pregnant. You know, the world, you took my daughter, you got her pregnant, you got to make it right. No, it's not about being pregnant. It's about taking her and her virginity. This is about losing her virginity and paying her father for what he has lost. Did you hear that? Paying her father. Pay the bride price. Who do you pay it to? The bride? No! You pay it to her covering. Her father. Look at this. This is Deuteronomy 22. If a man finds a young woman who is a virgin, who is not betrothed, sound like the same situation we have right now, and he seizes her, lies with her, and they are found out, then the man who lay with her shall give to the young woman's father 50 shekels of silver, and she shall be his woman because he humbled her. He shall not be permitted to divorce her all his days. Hear that? He shall not be permitted to divorce her all of his days. A woman doesn't divorce anybody. The man divorces the woman, but this man, because he took her without getting her father's permission, had to pay the bride price. Maybe you always pay the bride price and cannot divorce her all his days. Again, a man divorces a woman, not the other way around. The man goes free after six years. Not so with the woman, the maidservants. Different statutes and judgments pertaining to men and women, servants, and Amma and Shifka, male and female servants, sons and daughters. But look at this. He shall surely pay the bride price to her, to her, for her to be his woman. He's paying it to her father. But look what it says in the very next verse. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall still pay the money according to the bride price of virgins. How much was the bride price of virgins? It said 50 shekels of silver. He doesn't want to give her to this dork. But now he's got a woman in this house who's not a virgin anymore. That means he's got to disclose it if she gets married. Because remember, if a man takes a woman and marries her and finds that she's not a virgin, he can contest the marriage. He can say, hey, this daughter's not a virgin. And you're going to bring her out of his house and you're going to stone the woman. Why? Because she played the harlot in her father's house. What's the moral of the story, man? If you want to be crass, don't take a woman to yourself who's not betrothed, who's still a virgin. You're taking harlots. And that's what we have in this world today is a bunch of harlots who have taken men after man, a man after man after man. Ladies, we've got to understand that 
is a precious gift that's not to be given away to just anybody. We don't know. We haven't been trained. We don't understand the deeper things of these scriptures. There's so much more for us to see. I'm not going to make it through this chapter, am I? Twenty-two. Eighteen. Thou shall not permit a sorceress to live. Look at this. From now on, with just a few exceptions between this verse and, well, I put 23 verse 1, but really 23, even chapter, all of chapter 23, there's just a few exceptions where it's actually going to use the second person plural singular. Practically everywhere from here on in is going to be the second person masculine singular. Thou, thou, thy, thine. Thou shall not permit a sorceress to live. Yehovah is talking to his Ezra, his son Israel. Israel's seed, each man individually. Thou shall not permit a sorceress to live. Well, you know what? We're living in Babylon right now. Killing a sorceress, killing a homosexual is, is not going to be a good idea. But there's going to come a time when we're in our land and we will not permit a sorceress to live. He says, whoever lies with an animal shall surely be put to death. Well, you go to uh, Leviticus 18. We're going to talk about all those sexual things that gets a man killed. Sometimes the woman that he's with also. He who slaughters to any Elohim except Yehovah only, he shall be utterly destroyed. Each one of these is a separate judgment. It says sacrifices. The word is not sacrifices. Here's the word. Slaughter. Zavik. Zavik. It's what we eat. Slaughtering to other Elohim. Oh, isn't that interesting? To other, unto Elohim. You know, this is what Leviticus 17 is all about. Didn't see it the first time through, but I see it now. Slaughtering to other Elohim. Meat sacrificed to idols is how it gets translated, but it's poor translation. You can't see it. I said, isn't this what Leviticus 17 is all about? Slaughtering to other Elohim, killing meat the way those Elohim tell us to do it? Yeah, this is what we're talking about. You know, we all want to do the clean meat business. You know, hooves and double stomachs the different things, fish and scales, and all the stuff that goes with it. We got that, but we don't understand how it relates to Leviticus 17. How are we supposed to kill it? Whose standards are we supposed to kill it for? Do we eat meat that has been killed by other men? Secular men? Gentile men? Goy? Foreign people? Nokre? Am? I don't think so. They're doing it according to their Elohim's instructions. Yehovah is clearly saying what? He who slaughters to Elohim, to any Elohim, except Yehovah only, he shall be utterly destroyed. That's what it says in Leviticus 17. My way or destruction? Slaughter it the way I want you to slaughter it. Well, we'll talk about it when we get to Leviticus 17. I got a whole series that I wrote, Meat Sacrifice to Idols. Look it up. How about a, sl a Hillel slaughter to Allah? I'm gonna turn the animal towards the, what's the what's the uh, main thing that they have there? Do you remember that big square thing? Uh, no. Yeah, I forget too. Basically their temple.
All right. What is it? Kaaba. Yeah, maybe that's it. Um, thou shall neither mistreat a stranger nor oppress him. Thou. If we're talking about thou, then we know we're not talking about the stranger, are we? And if there's one law for the Ezra and one for the stranger, then we know if it's not the stranger we're talking about, then we got to be talking to the Ezra. Again, reinforcing who the thee and the thy and the thou are. Little context clues that just give us a little bit more light. Thou shall neither mistreat a stranger, a ger, nor oppress him, for you were garim, here's the plural form of garim, you were garim in the land of Egypt. 22. Thou shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. Afflict. The word afflict is this word right here. Ana. Ana. Afflict. Depression, a furrow, a furrow. Depression is formed between the eyes when watching intensely. The furrow may also be formed by concentration or depression. Afflict, to oppress another, causing depression. Oppression, I think this is what we're talking about. Oppression is what we're talking about here. Oppressing the widow, oppressing the orphan. Here, this is ancient Hebrew lexicon. But no, this is not ancient Hebrew. This must be um, word study. A verb indicating to be afflicted, to be oppressed, to be humbled. It refers to being oppressed in a state of oppression. It appears that oppression and depression are kindred spirits. Those are my words. You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any way, and they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry. Remember, he says he's a father to the widow and to the orphan. Orphan. You know, there's, there's, a, there's an interesting idea. We use the word orphan. Meaning what? No mother, no father. But that's not an orphan. An orphan is a fatherless child. These women who are divorcing their husband, which they're never supposed to do, are making their children fatherless. They're making their children orphans. They don't know it. They instead use this this high sounding uh, single parent, a single parent mother. Like it's some kind of badge of courage. It's not. It's a blemish on your life. Oh, but you don't know my husband. You don't know Jehovah's word. He says, if you afflict them in any way and they cry to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will become hot and I will kill you. This is, this is one of the places where we have a plural you, second person, plural masculine. I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall be widows and your children shall be fatherless. Ooh. Don't afflict the widow or the fatherless child. <laughs> if you lend money to any of my people who are poor among you, hear that? If you, this is talking about thee, if thou lend money to any of my people who are poor among thee, thou shall not be like the money lenders to him. Thou shall not charge him interest. Israel, Gee, I would like to know more rich Israelites. Israel does not charge interest to Israel. 
if thou ever take thy neighbor's garment as a pledge, thou shalt return it to him before the sun goes down. Why? For that is his only covering. It is his garment for his skin. What will he sleep in? And it will be that when he cries to me, I will hear, for I am gracious. Oh, that's really an interesting word. Yahovah calls himself gracious. The word is used solely as a descriptive term of Elohim. Yahovah uses this word when he reveals himself to Moses as one who is above all else merciful and abounding in compassion. For I am, what's the word here? Kanan, Kanun, gracious. Oh, we're almost done. I'm going to finish this up. Thou shall not revile Elohim. Makes it sound like God, doesn't it? But is this what we're talking about? Are we talking about reviling Yehovah? I don't think we are. I think we're talking about reviling the Elohim of the land. Look what it says. You shall not revile Elohim, nor curse a ruler of your people. Here, I like a uh, uh, Bible in basic English uh, translates this. You shall not say evil of judges or put a curse on the ruler of your people. The Geneva Bible, Old Bible, 1699. Thou shall not rail a upon the judges, neither speak evil of the rulers of thy people. Hear that? We're not talking about the judges and the rulers of the people of the land, are we? We're talking about thou shalt not speak evil of the judges or the rulers of thy people. Thy people. Yehovah appoints rulers lawmakers and judges over his people. This is what Moses did. Remember when he appointed judges? Uh, judges for thousands, judges for hundreds, judges for fifties, judges for tens. We said it was like 67,000 judges were appointed at that point. Or maybe it was 77,000 judges that were appointed at that point. A whole bunch of judges. Don't speak evil about those judges going to get you killed. You shall not delay to offer the first of thy ripe produce or thy juices. Thy produce or thy juices. Orange juice. Grape juice. How about wine? You shall not delay to offer the first of thy ripe produce and thy juices, the firstborn of thy sons, that's you, Wes, you shall give to me. The bakar of our sons we shall give to Yehovah. I was a bakar. Wes, my son who's with us today, is, a, is my bakar. I think we belong to Yahweh, Wes. We never had the redeeming price paid for us to redeem us back. That's what Israel does, so we get our sons back. Two more verses. Likewise, thou shalt do with thy oxen and thy sheep. Sheep, remember, sheep and goats. It shall be with its mother seven days. On the eighth day, you shall give it to me. Israel's seed circumcises their son on the eighth day. We're giving the goat, the firstborn of our flocks. What did it say? The oxen, the goats, the sheep 
to Yahovah. It's going to go to the priest. It's going to go to the priest. They're the representative for Yahovah. Perhaps circumcision on the eighth day is about giving our sons to Yehovah, another father. Just a thought. Is that what we're doing when we're circumcising our sons on the eighth day? I was circumcised on the eighth day. And you shall be holy men to me. Hear that? And you, this is now again, second person, plural, masculine, second person, masculine, plural. And you shall be holy men to me, men, ish, ish, and she, plural, and she, holy. You shall be holy men, men, holy. This is like Israel's seed. This is holy man, a possession. It's, it's using holy as a, what do they call it, a substantive noun. Holy man. Not just men, holy men. You shall be a holy man to me. You shall not eat meat torn by beasts in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. Well, that concludes chapters 21 and 22. Next week, we'll be doing 23. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me today. Uh, we went a little bit later than I'd like to. We've got really so many interesting things. I like this portion of Exodus. It goes from 22 or 21, 22, 23, 24. 24, I guess, is when it, 24 is when we start, or 25 is when we start. So we have 21, 22, 23, 24. Four chapters that has got these statutes in them, the judgments in them, that are, I just find very, very interesting. Maybe it's just three chapters, because now we're talking about Nadab and Abihu. So maybe it's just three chapters, but 21, 22, 23, I think they're interesting with all these different uh, judgments. These are the judgments of Yehovah. All right, well, let's stop here. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being a part of my class today. I uh, hope we can see you again. Remember, this is on YouTube. All my teaching is on YouTube. Uh, always available. Love you tons. Thanks, you guys. Mm -hmm.